Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it might be where you are and all around the world, the joys of the internet. Preferably, I would be in Toronto speaking to you face to face, however this is it, and such is life these days. Um, my name is Helga van Lochem, and I am based in South Africa, and I am responsible for the Sub-Saharan African region um, for all the commodities other than diamonds. And today we will be joined by my colleague in sunny Sydney, uh, Gavin Rech, and he is our technical expert and has been our technical expert on this particular commodity. So today I'd like to take you through two of the chrome projects in South Africa, um, chrome, chromite, chromium. Um, between uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe, we hold 70 to 85 percent of the world's chrome deposit. Um, all reserves and uh, yeah lucky me it's just around the corner and I get to uh, investigate what's going on down the road. The Bushveld Ipnias complex has been explained to me as a saucer shape or reserve and its eastern limb and western limb protrude on the ground. It's quite interesting it does expand 500 kilometers so that's rather large. The, the, the Bushveld is a layered mafric intrusion and one can see clearly the different layers with your own eyes. It's particularly famous for the UG2 formation, uh, which is, is a platinum mineralization as well as chrome. Um, but today we would like to speak more about the LG6. Traditionally, DMS was used, dense media separation, uh, to separate the valuable chrome from the, the barren peroxinites. Um, the, the minimum grade that most the furnaces require worldwide is a 38% CR203. Um, we'll speak a little bit more about that later. Uh, China Chrome imports 83% of its um, oil from South Africa. And in turn, South Africa exports about 48% of its oil to China. Um, the South African furnaces are... Uh, pretty impressive. However, there are very there are multiple constraints with our electricity costs, so that's causing a hindrance to our market. Hence, the China seems to be our top um, export um, preference. Um, this photo you'll see in the slide was um, taken by a drone. Um, and there's a picture of the previous DMS that was utilized on one of the plants we're going to speak about. Um, what is interesting, you can see right in the middle, the small, the small looks small in the picture, is the heavy medium drum that was used. Um, what's most interesting about this picture is the huge footprint it has. And more interesting is in the background, you'll see um, there's a thickener and a water plant, uh, water purification system, which with the Tom as we know, um, requires no water. Uh, so it's just a, a before and after, which I find quite quite fascinating. So in this slide, I would like to highlight um, some other factors that the clients took into consideration when they purchased the Tomra, other than the technical part of it. Um, just three of three of it. So when I speak about real estate restraints, the one mine was literally on the side of a mountain, and we had no space for a big huge DMS footprint as you'd seen in the previous slide um, and I'll needless to say to pump water up to the side of a mountain was also quite difficult so the Tomra size of one container was a bit of a no-brainer. In terms of the quick installation um, both mines the the one DMS had been shut down already and they needed to move fast and the other mine um, they needed to generate some cash to finance the balance of plant. They still needed some spirals for the fines to get the met grade. Um, and that was, and this particular plant was done from the time of installation until the time of signature until the time of commissioning was about six months. So it was a really quick turnaround. Basic structure needed to be built, convey in, convey out, not such a difficult installation. And then finally, South Africa is a bit renowned for some labor problems we have. Um, and uh, the concern is obviously skilled labor and to get people trained to operate a machine like this was uh, uh, people were a bit hesitant but um, Tomra supplied operators and skilled people 
And and I suppose it was in the beginning, it's just like the first time we got um, smartphones, you know, we didn't really know how to use it. But if we knew there was somebody standing next to us who could tell us how to use it, it became rather easy. And today, what, what would we do with our smartphones? Thank you very much, Helga. Uh, as mentioned, my name's Gavin Reck. I'm here in Tomra in Sydney, and I'll take you through a few of the following slides. Um, this video here basically shows how the XRT sort of works, uh, what it does to the Chrome and how it separates the waste from the product. Um, it's a belt machine. It's called our COM series. And uh, essentially it consists of a pan feeder up front there. Uh, the big sort of thing that you can see there, which presents those particles across the width of the machine in a nice monolayer, that feeder then drops that monolayer down a chute onto the main belt, which passes below the X-ray system and above the X-ray camera. And that is used to then uh, effectively grade, uh, calculate the density of each particle and compare it to a cut point um, to be able to decide whether that is a high grade high density chrome particle or a low grade, low density waste particle. So the chrome as a convention is uh, colored blue by the classified image and the low density waste, which is in this case being ejected is red. So there you can see the nozzles ejecting the air nozzles, pneumatically pushing those uh, waste particles over the spirit plate to effectively create the waste belt or the uh, reject belt on the left hand side and the product belt there in green on the right hand side. And that's effectively how the uh, sorter separates the two fractions. The concept of these XRT sorters is not new, I mean, or not to us anyway. I mean, there are still people that are quite apprehensive about the technology, but it's not an emerging technology. It's pretty well established across the world. We have 177 um, installed running machines globally at the moment, and that doesn't include the mothballed mines and the, the situations where the machines have got decommissioned or things have got to the end of life. Um, and so the availability of this technology and um, the amount of experience we have with it in the field is uh, on par with most pieces of mining machinery these days really. You can see the distribution across the globe there um, everywhere really and if you look at the XRT machine, the X-ray transmission machine which is in uh, uh, the light blue color in the bar graph on the left hand side, you can see that it is a very very large chunk of our installation base. This is our flagship, uh, it's about 70 percent of our sales and it is the most refined in terms of uh, quality as well as more importantly these days availability and serviceability and as you can see from that distribution the installation base is, is truly global and with offices here in Sydney and where Tom uh, South Africa where Helga is speaking from North America where the uh, you guys are visiting at the moment to visit the North American office and the European head office we have the ability to basically um, support uh, this process globally and that was very important especially with this Chrome project because work was done here in Australia. So that's uh, where uh, we live down here. And um, that's our test center. And we did do full performance test work on the Chrome before it, um, the machines were installed in South Africa. The test center on the left hand side, you will see the XRT machine. And on the right hand side there, you'll see the laser machine. And these are the same machines that you see in the brochures, the same machines we installed on site, the same machines we use uh, globally for all our applications. So we can run exactly the same material on exactly the same machine and really benchmark the expected performance of that uh, sorter. We have a hopper here and uh, we can load up up to a few tons of material and then send it up an elevating conveyor. And then we can distribute it either left or right and feed it into the hoppers above the XRT or laser sorter. That material will then run through whichever sorter we're using for that particular set of test work. And um, it will come out eventually on these takeaway conveyors down here. Uh, we can put that into bulk bags, depending on the mass of the particles we're sorting, and run it at uh, a level where we can stand behind that in terms of a performance test and uh, expectations for actual site uh, performance. Here's an example of the images and outcomes of that uh, 
test work. On the left hand side you can see a grayscale image of the raw x-ray image which is transitioning into the classified image. A classified image is classifying that high density chrome as blue and black as per the uh, video earlier and the red particles are waste um, and the sorter is going to then separate these waste particles from the uh, blue and black product particles. And here's a process flow for one of our test work sessions. Um, you can see here we're using an XRT sorter. We're putting 400 kilograms odd through the sorter and taking 46% of it into the product. So this product over here is running at about 40% uh, chrome. This is assayed externally at the laboratory. And the remaining half of the uh, particles are reporting to waste at a 15% chrome grade. And then we take these waste particles and we send them through another stage of XRT sorting to produce a middlings, a uh, smaller mass, 25% of the 54%. So that's what about 25, uh, it's about 12.5% uh, overall. And um, that is, uh, end up with a chrome grade of about 35% and a waste grade, which is just behind my head there. Sorry, you'll have to trust me that a final waste grade of 7%. So these results are achieved in the test work and were very, very similar to what was achieved on site. And I'll show you that a bit later. But for now, I'll hand back to Helga. This picture is an aerial shot of the installation at Durenbosch. As you can see, it was a container roused installation. It was a tertiary machine. Um, the chrome enters the, the sort from the right hand side, goes through a screen where the, the oversize is removed and um, is fed to a screen feeder. Uh, it does a rather good job and removes all the fines, chromite being rather uh, friable. Uh, it enters the machine and on the right hand side of the machine, it, uh, the waste is put onto an existing waste um, conveyor and the product is, um, is conveyed to the left hand side. Um, this particular plant does between 75 and 110 tons an hour. Um, the, they call it the sweet spot is between 15 and 45 millimeter. They seem, seem to get the maximum yield, the maximum grade with that. I know there's always a playoff with that. Um, but product, it's a steady 38 to 41% chrome, and that's what the furnaces are, are requiring, and a real throwaway waste of 10 to 14% chrome. This is a great drone uh, picture of this particular plant. I think it was just after it got installed, um, but you can pretty much see it in action there. The back you see they're preparing all the different products, they're sampling, um, they sample every single, I think every hour on the hour initially, now they do it twice a day. As you can see, it's pretty. It's a small footprint, and it was quite easy to find a spot somewhere in the middle of that existing mine to run this plant. And this one is the installation of black chrome. As you can see, it was built on the back of a mountain. Um, so the size of the container went quite well. Um, so this one also, so there were two installations for this particular one. So what they, we call chips and what we call lumpy, chips being 10 to 30 and lumpy 30 to 80, sometimes 90. And again, the, the chips was doing an easy 80 tons an hour and the lumpy was doing a good 140 tons an hour. Uh, there's some bad screening sometimes up front, so some of the oversize had to be removed. But once that had been um, sorted out, it was it was quite an, an easy sailing. And um, this particular mine was also this one was run of mine versus the previous one that was a lot of um, dumps. Um, they were feeding at 17 to 27 percent chrome, and again a constant 36, 41 percent chrome product, um, and, a, and a real decent throwaway waste of six percent. Again, this is quite nice footage of the of the installation process at Black Chrome. You can see the cranes are there. Um, again, and you can see the linear uh, footprint of this particular plant 
versus a very huge footprint of a DMS. Conveyor in, uh, conveyor out. This particular installation was built rather high. Um, I think they just wanted room and access to move around. They were initially started um, processing uh, stockpiles, but very quickly they were running run of mine. And thank you, Holger. So the information we've given you thus far has demonstrated the amount of data that the sorter will collect on all these individual particles. And it is quite impressive, but it's also very useful to use this data. Um, so we have every particle being assessed in terms of size and grade and location on the belt, so we can decide whether to accept it or reject it. And that information can be utilized in various other ways in the uh, remainder of the plant. So what we've done is come up with the insight package, which is a very refined way of packaging this information and providing it to the customer. And basically what that will do is take all this uh, information and put it into a format, whatever format you choose. So we can look at uh, uh, mass yield to the product and waste. We can look at the size distribution of the particles. We can look at trends in terms of capacities and et cetera, et cetera. And this information can be loaded up onto a very secure database and uh, essentially accessed uh, via the web or via an app or via whatever the management guys want to use, as well as being directly accessed from the machine in a Modbus, Profibus, uh, plant control kind of uh, format that can then be used to control the feed to the sorter, control the uh, settings of the downstream plant or whatever you choose to do with that. Um, used to be a secondary benefit, this level of data, but it's really starting to form a, a very uh, a very significant benefit to the rest of the process plant. And customers are starting to rely on this quite heavily. Let me show you what that looks like for the chrome mines. Here we have a couple of trends and plots that we produced while we're working on the chrome mines. And as you can see in this top plot, we have the orange colored waste particles and the blue colored uh, chrome particles reporting in the sorter. So there you can see the combination of them, obviously the overall capacity and then the ratio of the two being the trends in terms of product and waste um, throughout the day for the, with a timestamp. In the bottom left hand side there you can see the, the uh, chaos from a shift to shift level on uh, what we would consider feed grade and feed mass and product grade and uh, waste grade uh, and masses because that changes so much in the very heterogeneous uh, waste dump. You know, waste dumps are chaotic in terms of what they produce, and the, the sort is doing exactly that, taking this chaotic um, variable feed and producing a constant uh, product, which is its job. And at the end of the day, it will be able to produce, uh, the, the insight system that is, is able to produce a shift report for a particular number of hours or particular time of day, um, that will take all that information and put it into a standard format that can be exported automatically to whoever is interested in it. Now, this gave us a huge amount of information, and let's have a look at that information over an entire year. Here we have the mass pools to product and waste, as well as the grade of product and waste for an entire year for one of the chrome mines. Now, what I've done is I've ordered it by descending feed grade. So this blue line you see going from the top left to the bottom right is your descending feed grade. Now, if I hadn't, if I'd ordered it just by, by shift, it, it's obviously all up and down because of the, um, the waste dump. Um, but what we notice is as the feed grade decreases, the mass to waste increases, which is what you'd expect, right? If it's got lower grade, it's got more waste, and therefore there's more mass in, in, in the waste belt, which is awesome. But what's really interesting is this red line here, which is the grade of the product. And that grade of that product reigns very constant throughout the year, sitting around 40%, which if you remember correctly, was the grade of the product we got during the test work that I, of the slide I showed earlier. So that consistency followed the, the, the machine into the field and produced this beautiful trend throughout the year. And the only thing that changed was the mass that was going to that product and waste, because that's what the machine does. It takes product and puts it in the product uh, conveyor and the waste goes into the other conveyor and the mass proportions of those two change because of the feed grade changes and that's that's great it shows the stability of the Tomra product but it also shows the beautiful liberation characteristics of this material and the consistency of that liberation so as long as you're feeding a consistent product doesn't matter what you're feeding it in terms of grade um, the liberation characteristics are constant and we can take chrome away from waste then we can produce this level of consistency in terms of our product 
and waste. And there, that uh, the line on the bottom there is the, the grade of the waste. And uh, the grade of the waste, if you remember, in two stages in the test work, we got 7% grade in our waste. And here in one stage in, on site, we're getting just below 10% uh, as a trend throughout the entire year in our waste grade. So a really, truly um, applicable technology in terms of uh, de-risking it through test work and then applying those exact performance criteria and achieving them on site. And I think that's something we're, we're, very, uh, we're very proud of, to be honest. I'll hand back to uh, Helga and she'll uh, finish off the last couple of slides. Thank you very much. So in closing, where to from here? Um, I suppose the close relationship that Platinum has with Chrome, I think that's the next step quite easily. It, it, it is being done as we speak. Um, I think we've got a lot of data now. And I think um, this, this industry and, and, and XRT without water is, is a bit of a no-brainer. And I think the more clients are prepared to uh, pursue an XRT technology, the less and less they'll be tempted to use a, a DMS technology that's been around for some time, uses massive quantities of water, huge footprint, lots of pumps, multiple different pieces of equipment. I think, um, yeah, I think the, the Tomra machine in the Chrome industry is here to stay. Uh, with that, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And um, we're certainly open to any questions.